please do turn in your Bibles to 2 Peter. We've reached chapter 3, page 1,223, if you're using the Bibles on the seats. And we're going to look at verses 1 to 10 together. 2 Peter, chapter 3, beginning to read at verse 1. Dear friends, this is now my second letter to you. I have written both of them as reminders to stimulate you to wholesome thinking. I want you to recall the words spoken in the past by the holy prophets and the command given by our Lord and Savior through your apostles. Above all, you must understand that in the last days, scoffers will come, scoffing and following their own evil desires. They will say, where is this coming, he promised. Ever since our ancestors died, everything goes on just as it has since the beginning of creation. But they deliberately forget that long ago, by God's word, the heavens came into being, and the earth was formed out of water and by water. By these waters, also the world of that time was deluged and destroyed. By the same word, the present heavens and earth are reserved for fire, being kept for the day of judgment and destruction of the ungodly. But do not forget this one thing, dear friends. With the Lord, a day is like a thousand years, and a thousand years are like a day. The Lord is not slow in keeping his promise, as some understand slowness. Instead, he is patient with you not wanting anyone to perish, but everyone to come to repentance. But the day of the Lord will come like a thief. The heavens will disappear with a roar, the elements will be destroyed by fire, and the earth and everything done in it will be laid bare. This is the word of the Lord. Thanks be to God. Lord, we humbly confess as we come to this portion of your word that our hearts are indeed prone to wander. We're prone um, to leave you, the God that we love. And Lord, this um, passage is um, heavy and pray, Lord, that my speech will be full of truth and full of grace and full of love. That you'll give us insight, Lord, that you'll stir us, encourage us, shake us where um, necessary, that your word through the power of your spirit might indeed penetrate um, to our hearts and minds. We ask this for Jesus Christ's sake. Amen. Amen. Please do be seated and do turn to two, um, Peter. And we've got a handout um, for you to follow along and use the questions uh, at home. So someone said to me just before I came up, is this round um, three, um, uh, uh, the false teachers, you remember last week it was round um, two, pretty much, um, pretty much. Um, it seems to me that we've become um, ill-equipped to handle delays. I, I see it when people are leaving church and they've uh, switched off the mobile phone and they're frantically tapping it and shaking it because it's not coming on um, quick enough for those who switch off their mobile phones during the services. Obviously, not everyone does. Is it a matter of seconds, but people seem to be cursing the technology. Why, why isn't it back on? Why isn't the reception there? Or we stand at the microwave, waiting in frustration for the meal to be ready, unaware that 50 years ago, the idea that you could have a meal ready in two minutes and 50 seconds was unheard of. But no, no, come on, what's, what's, how is it going to come out? You see, I just think it's difficult within our culture, because of the way things have advanced, I do think technology has made it harder for us to wait and to be patient. It's difficult. Even though the reality is that we um, wait less today than people have ever waited. We travel at high speed, so we wait less time on journeys. Communication, which formerly took months, now can be completed in um, seconds. Meals, which took hours, can be cooked in minutes. People used to have to wait and had to save to get a car or a sofa, and now you can get it on credit and with loans. We're just not accustomed to waiting. It's difficult um, to wait. We're really on the back foot in the whole waiting game. And then Peter, here he 
um, comes and his aim in chapter um, 3 is to help his fellow believers wait in the right frame of mind. In order to live productive lives in the present age, we've got to be convinced and confident about the age um, to come and therefore wait patiently for it. Now, I personally believe that one of the biggest impacts on our productivity as Christians is how confident we are about Jesus' return and the next world. I think it's one of the biggest impacts on it. Diminish that and diminish the impact that you'll have through your productivity for Christ. How confident are we that Jesus will wrap up all things? Because the church that Peter is writing to, we know from last week and the week before, has been infiltrated by false teachers, and they do not believe that it's going to happen. As far as they can concern, Christ is not going to return, and there's pressure and put on Christians to disbelieve that Christ will return as judge of all things, ushering in a new era. And that pressure has increased tenfold, a hundredfold um, in our day. So let's begin looking at the first four verses and this uh, idea of Scripture versus scoffers. I love the word scoffers. Do you like the word scoffers? Some have it as mockers. I prefer scoffers. But in these first four verses... The opponents are lined up against each other. In one corner, you've got the word of God. And then in the other corner, you've got the words of the godless. And Peter says, verses 1 and 2, that if the word of God is going to come out fighting, you've got to be reminded of it. You've got to recall what has been said. You've got to continually bring it to mind. It's the illustration Richard gave two weeks ago, do you remember, about the jade you become so familiar with the jade that when you place anything else in your hand, you know that it's fake. And we've got to be so familiar with the truth that anybody tries to put falsehood in our hands and we immediately recognize it. Or it's doing what Liam exhorted us to do last week, to drink full and to drink deep of the Word of God. That's how we're reminded. That's how we recall these things. Dear friends, we have this choice each one of us, about whether we're going to be embarrassed by the Word of God or whether we're going to be emboldened with the Word of God. That's the choice. Are you going to be embarrassed by the Word of God? Are you going to be emboldened by it? Because if you're embarrassed by it, what will happen is someone will scoff. They'll come and scoff. And then you'll be embarrassed by your biblical convictions. And so you'll hide them under the carpet. You'll keep them behind um, closed doors. Maybe you'll even excuse speaking up because you'll just say, well, it wouldn't be appropriate for me to air my beliefs, even though everybody else in the factory or the workplace or the university or school are doing exactly that. And the problem is, when you become embarrassed by your beliefs, embarrassed by the truth contained in the Scriptures, you begin to extract yourself from those beliefs So if you become embarrassed by them, then you extract yourself um, from them. Saying things like, well, I know there are some Christians who hold to that, but I'm not one of them. I know there are some churches who teach those kind of things, but we're not one of those um, churches. That's what whole community um, church has done this week, if you look at their things on Facebook. Oh, they'd be completely embarrassed by St. John's, the kind of things that that church stands for. I can tell you something now that Christ is embarrassed by them. They're a disgrace. A disgrace. See, if you let go, if you're embarrassed by the word of God rather than emboldened by it, you depart from the word of God. Then you depart from Christ, don't you? See, we must be emboldened with the word of God. Not allowing people to rob us of the precious truths of Scripture by distorting them. And when those around us are denying the teaching of the Lord, we'll stand up. We'll be the ones who are loud and proud, determined to hold fast to the Bible's teaching uncompromisingly. And if God has given us his great and very precious promises, then we're not about to let rebellious people prize it out of our hands or prize it out of our hearts or heads. No, we have to recall these things. We have to bring them to mind, and we have to be emboldened by them, not embarrassed. 
Because as we remind ourselves of the truth, what are other people doing? They're ridiculing the truth. That's the fight that's going on. Now, I've never much liked being mocked. I guess that's why I do so much of it to others. It doesn't give much space for others to do it to you if you get in first. Now, if you're the target of ridicule, it can often get you to change your mind, can't it, about a particular idea or issue. Not because, here's the interesting thing about ridicule, not because people are bringing forth good arguments to the contrary. No, they're just exerting pressure through mocking that demeans you. But it's not good arguments against your reason. It's ridicule your reason, ridicule um, your truth. And rather than look silly, rather than look at odds with everybody else, you change your view, compromise your convictions. I just want to say, it's so good that Peter uses ridicule, because we could just brush it off, or sticks and stones may hurt my bones, but calling names will never hurt me. I said, there's a lot of damage done with words. Ridicule really, really does have power. Think about this. A guy starts to wear a particular item of clothing, and his mates mercilessly mock him, ridicule him. What happens? That particular three-quarter length knitted cardigan <laughs> um, is never seen again. <laughs> Through mocking and ridicule, you can get someone to discard an item of clothing. But let me tell you something else as well. Through mocking and ridicule, the world is getting the church to discard items of truth. So easily done. There's so much power in ridicule. And these scoffers believe that God has had plenty of time to fulfill his promise to return. And thus they conclude, look, his time is up. If he hasn't come by now, they say, he simply isn't coming. So as Christians, we mustn't underestimate the power of ridicule. Christians and churches have abandoned certain clear teachings of the law purely because that teaching now evokes laughter from the world, scoffing from the world. And when all around you are living as if Jesus isn't going to return and laugh at anybody who would suggest otherwise, it's hard to remain emboldened in the truth, isn't it? It's hard to live for the world to come when other people are saying, world to come? <laughs> what a laugh. Get with it. Eat, drink, and be merry. Tomorrow you die. Now, if you're going to hold fast to the Bible, I can tell you now, I will promise you this. I'll give you a prophetic word. If you're going to hold fast to the Bible, uncompromisingly, you're going to be ridiculed. That's it. And then verses 5 to 9, we get, let's move on. Let's think it in the category of thoughtfulness versus forgetfulness. The scoffing arises because these people are just forgetful about certain truths. And the faithful are emboldened because of thoughtfulness about the truth. The scoffers forget that uh, the God's word is a seal. The first thing the false um, teachers uh, just forget about, deliberately forget about, is that the world was made by God and the world hangs on the word of God. It was brought into existence by God, by his Word, it continues to be sustained at every point by his powerful word. It's not running on its own. It's not ticking along nicely through natural causes of events. And of course, the media, pumping us the last um, sort of, well, years now, believe that humanity will be the cause of the, either the Earth's demise or its reju rejuvenation, isn't it? Humanity. But the Bible is clear that the one who formed the earth out of nothing in the beginning is the one who will bring this current world to its new beginning. You see, the other thing the scoffers ignore is that God's world has sealed something already, hasn't it? They just say, oh, things have just continued ever since um, the beginning. But what they forget is that God brought judgment on the world in the flood of Noah's day. A great upheaval of the world's natural flow of events and natural order. God has shown, therefore, that he can and he will alter the course of world history through 
judgment. He did it in the past by water, and in the future, he will do it with the coming fire of Jesus' return. So they're deliberately forgetful that God's word has already sealed things, the creation of the world and the judgment of the world. And when you put a bit of thought into it, this is where we get to verse 8, thoughtfulness versus forgetfulness. When you put a bit of thought into it, you soon realize that God's uh, time is subjective, the time that God has created. In verse 8, Peter is answering the criticism that Christ has delayed so long that he uh, can't really believe that he's coming back. And Peter's answer is, well, from God's experience of time, it's not been very long at all. Now, just think about this. This concept isn't foreign to us, the whole idea that we experience time differently. Age has an impact on um, time, doesn't it? Age has an impact on time. If you're a young child stuck in the back seat of a crowded car on a long journey... That four-hour journey seems like 40 years. <laughs> to the children, about 80 years to the parents. <laughs> but the older we get, we often talk about the faster time um, goes. How many older people say, it just seems like yesterday I was in school. It just seems like yesterday that we got married. It just seems like yesterday that the kids were um, young. Age has an impact on how we experience time. Joy levels also have an experience on um, how we experience time differently. If you're having a boring day at school or at uni or at work, time seems to drag forever because boredom, joy levels have an impact on how we experience time. But what happens when you go on that holiday to Spain in that luxury villa? What happens then when you're having so much fun? Have we really been here a week, you say in the airport as you're about to leave? It just flies by, doesn't it? flies by. Well, here, just think about this. If we can experience time differently based on age and happiness, how do you think the ageless one, who is completely full of joy within himself, experiences time? Well, Peter says, a day is like a thousand years and a thousand years like a day to the Lord. When Jesus comes back and stands on this earth to make it his own, he will say, well, it just, just seems like yesterday I was here. You see, there's no argument against Christ's second coming that 1,986 years have passed since his departure. From God's experience of time, we use that loosely, that phrase, it's as though Christ arrived at his hand the day before yesterday. See, in the mocker's view this length of time reflects badly on God's ability or his willingness to bring about his kingdom. But in truth, it's the exact opposite. That's what it says in verse 9, doesn't it? Peter moves on to say that God's patience is not slowness. No, the length of the Lord's delay in coming to establish his kingdom is directly proportionate to his patience and long-suffering towards sinful men. So the delay, rather than being a sort of pretext to accuse God, is actually caused to adore God. You see, we shouldn't count the delay of Christ's coming. Uh, we, should, we should view it as an act of mercy and patience until all the sheep are gathered in to the fold so that not one of them has lost John 10. And here's the tragic irony with false um, teachers. They take God's patience, which has given them an opportunity to repent, and they turn it against God as evidence that Christ isn't coming, and so we can just live corrupt lives following our own evil desires. For those who take God's gift of time and use it as an argument for unbelief and an opportunity for ungodliness, Peter says only judgment awaits, certain judgment but finally, we have, in verse 10, fact versus fiction. At verse 10, um, when I was reading this, and I was like, oh, verse 10, it just summarizes and answers everything. It's a cutting indictment of the false teachers um, scoffing uh, and their, their thinking and their living. 
The day of the Lord will come upon an unsuspecting world like a thief, it says in the first part of verse 10. This shows that the Lord is speedy, not slow. Scoffers who reject God's word because the world goes on as usual and there's no um, indication of impending doom. And Jesus says, of course it does. Because I'm going to come like a thief. There will be no indication of the impending doom. It will come upon, uh, upon you suddenly. Catch you off um, guard. And the scoffers have stated that everything goes on as it has from the beginning. They believe that the earth is immovable. And Peter declares that no, it's God's plan to judge the earth that is unstoppable. Second half of verse 10. They think, look, it's like the foundation of the earth is the surest thing in life. And Peter says, no, the surest thing in life is the foundations of God's promises that he will return to judge all the people and make all things new. The fiction that the scoffers build their lives upon is that nothing will change and nobody will be held accountable. And the last cut-in indictment in verse 10 is that everything will be opened up, not hidden away. Everything done in it will be laid bare. That laid bare is open, <laughs> open to see, bare, at naked. Everything will be in the open. The fires of God's judgment will reveal every action, every thought, every motive. And many living under the delusion that they'll never stand before God, the holy judge, will have to give an account for how they've used the life that he gave them. They live confident that what's done in secret will remain in secret. But it's not so. Everything done in, in it will be laid bare. Nothing will be hidden away. Let me finish. Dear friends, don't let ridicule of scoffers or the passage of time weaken your resolve to live knowing that Jesus will return. Don't lose heart. Don't weaken in your resolve to live the truth of the Bible because others are scoffing at it and churches are diluting it and moving away from it. Because you know what they've forgotten? Christ is coming and he's coming as judge. And that delay is meant to lead to repentance, not unbelief. That delay is meant to live, well, I won't take the passage from next week, but uh, living in purity. Because in God's economy of things, you know, it's only been a couple of days. And when we're surrounded by scoffers, don't be embarrassed about the return of Christ. Be emboldened by it so that your whole life is lived confident of where the world is heading and confident that you'll stand before Christ, the judge, to give an account. The world is against us. Unfortunately, many, many churches are against us as they weaken their resolve to hold fast to the truth. It's been 2,000 years. But Christ will return as the judge of the living and the dead. Hold fast. Don't be embarrassed. Be bold. Let's pray. Lord, we sung before um, the sermon that our hearts are prone to wander, prone to love you, the Lord we love. We know it, Lord. You know it better than we know it. Make firm our resolve, Lord. Remind us, recall and the truth to our hearts and minds. Make us bold in the truth, bold for Jesus. Enable us to live confidently as we wait for his return. Amen.